welcome everyone to the Strategic HR Next Practices series. We have a terrific guest here today, Julie Lodge Jarrett, Chief People and Purpose Officer at Dick Sporting Goods. Just a reminder, we want to hear from you. Uh, please post questions in the chat throughout. We're gonna we're gonna answer them um, as they come up and as we as we get a moment in a break. And um, this is an interactive session, so so let's let's hear from you again. Tell us hello, welcome. Tell us where you're where you're calling in from. We'd love to hear from you. For those of you on the call who are unfamiliar with us, the Institute for Corporate Productivity, I4CP, is the leading authority on next practices in human capital. We produce more research than any other human capital research firm in the world. I4CP is distinguished by its laser focus on what talent practices high performance organizations do differently from others. We define high performing organizations by looking at revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction over a five year period to understand what talent practices correlate to strong market performance. We are a member based organization of whom these are just a few. We are fortunate to conduct research free from any influence of external consultants or vendors. In fact, our members are the ones that drive our research. And we have a database representing 30,000 organizations worldwide to service the best and next practices. I4CP has a great white paper out right now on employee listening strategy. Our research has found that 66% of organizations that successfully changed their culture first gathered employee sentiment to understand how their current culture was perceived. This white paper contains our recommendations for putting in place an effective employee listening strategy. I encourage you to visit our website to download a copy. I'll post the link here shortly in the chat and uh, contact the I4CP team for a deeper discussion on it. I'm Catherine Brecken, Senior Research Analyst with I4CP, and I'm joined by my co-host and colleague, Kevin Kopstick, Senior Director of Member Services and Programs. And just a reminder that I4CP has a number of upcoming calls, including October 27th, we'll hear from Dachi Sanko about their employee work-life harmony. November 10th, just in time for the giving season, we'll hear from Hallmark and how they're getting hybrid work right. Um, and then the following Thursday, you'll have an opportunity to join us for DE and, uh, DEI Next Practices with the Moxie Exchange. Um, and just, just a reminder that we wanna hear from you. Please post questions in the chat. Um, we've got a great session ahead. For those of you who don't know, I4CP's Next Practices Now is the number one conference for senior leaders. These are just some of the phenomenal speakers who will be presenting. Um, really relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, there's Todd Jacobson, Head of Social Responsibility with the NBA, and we have Harvard Business Professor Amy Edmondson, one of the foremost research, researchers on psychological safety. Uh, those are just a few. We will have more announcements um, in the coming months of other speakers. It's a great opportunity to hear from the leading thinkers in this space, but also to network with your colleagues, meet new colleagues, um, and as the co-founder of I4CP, Jay Jamrog likes to say, it's a great party. <laughs> Before I wrap our housekeeping duties, the month of October isn't just for pumpkin spice lattes. We are asking audiences at every I4CP event to poll questions related to employee listening strategy. And Zeta, our wonderful, wonderful colleague in marketing, has posted um, these two poll questions. If you could go ahead and register your response. We would greatly appreciate it. We are collecting this information, benchmarking what organizations are doing in the employee listening uh, product process. Kevin, any bets on, on what the top response options are gonna be? Well, from talking to several members, what I hear is that a lot of our members are actually moving now away from that census survey type of a thing that once a year or once every two years, and they are doing many more pulse surveys. So I'm very curious as to the results. I'm, I'm very curious to see how frequently now a lot of our members are, are polling their um, their employees. Yes, I'm also really curious about sort of the always on approach to employee listening. Would love to hear from people in the chat um, if yeah. this is something you do. How how are you doing it? How are you surfacing um, this data? Uh, okay. We're still 
still predominant the once or twice a year. Uh, yeah. And then when serve the, the second one, we review and analyze writing comments manually. We're hearing um, a, a lot about the need for better qualitative analysis platforms out there and um, in our employee listening conversations. And Likert is also a positive option as well. Wonderful. Thank you everybody for taking our polls. Excellent. Kevin, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Thanks, Catherine. I really appreciate the opportunity. And as you mentioned earlier, Julie Lodge Jarrett is the Senior Vice President of Chief People and Purpose, excuse me, Chief People and Purpose Officer at Dick Sporting Goods. Julie joined the company in April of 2020 as the Senior Vice President, Chief People Officer, and recently assumed additional responsibility for communications, sustainability, and government affairs. In the expanded role, Julie's responsible for leading the overall talent and reputation strategy for Dix, while ensuring that the company's culture, communications, policies, and experiences align with its overall objectives and values. I really love that statement, really love the description. Prior to joining Dix, Julie spent more than 21 years at Ford Motor Company, most recently serving as the chief talent officer. We're also very pleased to have a member of Julie's senior team with us on the call today, Kelly Lapiani. She's the senior manager of HR strategy and operations, and she'll be helping us with some of the multimedia examples that Julie has brought to share to illustrate what we're discussing today. Hi, Kelsey, and thanks for your help. I have the pleasure, I have had the pleasure of working with Kelsey and with Julie Lodge Jarrett, most excuse me, most especially over the last six and a half years, both at Dix and previously in her time at Ford. I'm very happy for other I4CPA members to get the chance to know Julie and some of the great things that she and her team are doing at Dix. How are you doing, Julie? I'm good, Kevin. Good to be back. Glad to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. I really have to say again, I love the description of your overall responsibility, it, not just the title. It really speaks loudly for Dick's true values and even more so of the intent of your executive team and your board that these are real commitments. They're not just aspirational rhetoric. Our research has shown that many organizations are really still struggling to put their values into actions. While Dick's has really doubled down on your commitments to your employees and to your communities. We're looking forward to learning more about that today. Your company values and the purpose are really truly embedded in your employee experiences. And you know, we know that Dick Sporting Goods is America's largest sporting goods retailer. And over the years, it's made headlines for the hefty support of its leaders and its employees and how you get behind the organization's values how you make them real. I think it would be helpful though to our members if you could kick us off, tell us a little bit about Dix and, and how your strategy built its talent and reputation. Sure, Kevin, uh, happy to share. And so we are heading into our 75th year as a company. And um, we were started by a, a young man who was having a frustrating experience at a bait and tackle shop because his boss wasn't listening to him. And so he went home and complained to his grandmother, who gave him $300 from her cookie jar and suggested he start his own bacon and tackle shop. And that was literally the impetus of Dick Sporting Goods. Um, fast forward to, to several decades later, and um, our founder's son, Ed Stack, took the company from two stores to 850 stores, which is where we are today, and, and multiple different banners. And as we've gone over the years and looked at what we wanted to become as a company and really wanting to be that company with a heart and soul and, and be part of something bigger than ourselves. It's purpose over profits. Now, we're not nonprofit, so profits are important, but how do we do it in a way that's authentic to us? Um, and you talked about aspirational rhetoric, and, and we'll never be that company that speaks on everything. Um, we speak on what's core to us. We speak on the matters that we think we have a right to speak on because either we have an expertise or they're rooted in sport. Um, and when we speak, 
we're speaking because we're committed to advocating and advancing the conversation. And so you can see here some examples. Kelsey and I grappled. We had a, a number of different examples to share. Um, so there are some that are left on the cutting floor, but um, everything from our philanthropic arm of the company, our, our Dick Sporting Goods Foundation and the Sports Matter Organization, um, to our stance on assault firearms, um, mm -hmm. to our zero tolerance policy, to most recent actions around a concept called our teammate relief fund and financial well-being. And then our latest venture, um, uh, kind of like we bought a zoo, we we bought a school and we're partnering to um, to advance education uh, and sport. So look forward to talking about our journey more. Really love you sharing those because we're going to be talking specifically about some of those that you mentioned during the call today. I believe that you have a video that uh, we can share that exemplifies how Dix has really leaned into the communities. But um, maybe you can talk us through that as we go through. Sure. So we thought we'd mix it up for you guys. I've been on these one hour plus conference calls where it's really easy to be a passive participant. So we did bring some multimedia Fingers crossed it works and hopefully it keeps you engaged. Um, but we'll get started with a little bit of an introduction to our Sports Matter program. Hockey in Anchorage, Alaska is huge. We're all born on skates, just about. I've always looked up to the girls on the high school teams. Nice pass. My whole team is my family. I eat, sleep, breathe hockey. The funding just disappeared overnight. We got approached by the community and asked us to, to step in and, and help salvage the program. And we uh, salvaged it for three years, but finances are a concern. The girls have been using the same jerseys for at least four seasons now. I just feel like nobody really cares about girls hockey as much. By the end of the season, we'll probably be in the red. So unfortunately, we're thinking we're gonna have to shut the girls program down. The idea that we couldn't fund another funder is devastating for them socially, it's devastating academically, and I think it's devastating for their personal growth. These girls who have college scholarships on the horizon, we're sending a terrible message. These young women in four to seven years are going to be working professionals, and we're telling them that they're not equal. I feel like I failed these young women. everyone. My name is Frank and I work at Dick's Sporting Goods and I heard that you guys aren't going to be funded next season. We felt like we had to do something. Teams just like yours all across the country are not able to play because of lack of funding. That's a problem. We think it's a big problem because we believe all kids should get a chance to play. And by this crowd, I can tell it's important to your community. So this Christmas, we wanted to give you a special present. I thought this was going to be my last year for girls hockey. 
I'm so thankful for you guys and what you guys are doing. Words just can't explain how happy I am. Wow, I love that video. Uh, and it, it's so interesting too, because it, it, it's something you would think of like a local store doing, but really you're a national company with headquarters across the nation. Um, and it, it just had such a special feel, um, authentic feel, you know, to, to what you were doing for those girls. And that is a Minnesotan where hockey is life. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I, uh, I wanna remind the audience to ask questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, while people are typing, uh, typing their questions quickly, uh, I want to highlight the connection between this example and I4CP's framework, the new corporate currency, which really highlights the link between purpose, culture, and brand, which we see here um, in this great example. Um, I'm going to put a link to that in the chat um, to a video from our VP of Research, Kevin Martin, who breaks down this framework to show how HR can achieve strategic alignment and agility. Um, Dick Sporting Goods Foundation stepped in in a big way to help this, these teams. Um, what compelled the foundation, the company, to lean in on this case? How did, how did it link Dick's purpose and its culture and its brand? Sure. So our vision as a company is to be the world's largest sporting goods store. And it's more than that because we believe at Dick's that sports make people better. Um, and the reality is for any of us who've been an athlete or who played a sport, we know that we're more disciplined. We have great respect. We know what teamwork is like. It develops phenomenal work ethic, and it really prepares you to be on teams um, in a corporate world and, and as adults. And so the reality is, though, access to sport isn't equal across our country, and the gap has widened even more so with the pandemic. Our research tells us that 44% of sporting programs um, across communities have been somehow impacted, either closed or merged or significantly reduced. And what's even more troubling is kids from low income or income restricted homes are quitting sports at six times the rate of kids from higher income communities simply because of financial constraints. And so we believe every kid has the right to play. And since 2014, we've invested more than $100 million into saving youth sports. It sounds altruistic, but it's part of who we are at our core. And just uh, this past year alone, we've given nearly 19 million in grants to fund um, uh, up to 2 million kids the opportunity to play when they otherwise wouldn't have. Wow, that's just fantastic and so meaningful. Um, we're seeing a lot of people agreeing in the chat. There's a lot of um, hearts and <laughs> exclamation marks. Um, and, you know, Brett's commenting, I quit hockey at age 11 because of uh, equipment expenses. It's a really, it's a really big deal. Um, and you've just made such a difference in, in that town and in that in Anchorage is like all of those girls in their life. Um, it's really quite amazing. And so it's, we're not seeing any questions in the chat. I'm going to segue to the next topic. Um, in the wake of the 2017 Parkland shooting that left 17 people dead at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Dick Sporting Goods CEO Ed Stack announced it would no longer sell assault style rifles or high capacity magazines and it would stop selling firearms uh, to anyone under age 21. What I've always found impressive about this example is, or this, this, this case is that the weapons used in the tragedy weren't from your stores. And this was a policy decision, not just some like public statement or marketing gimmick. It had a real bottom line impact on the company's business strategy. And Dix followed it up with action, a national advocacy strategy to improve firearm safety regulation. We have a video of Dix Sporting Goods CEO, Ed Stack uh, on this decision. Kelsey, can you cue that up for us? Excellent. He's the chairman and CEO of Dick Sporting Goods, the nation's largest sporting goods retailer. And just moments ago, he released an open letter announcing that Dick's will no longer sell assault style rifles, no longer sell firearms to anyone under 21 years of age, no longer sell high capacity magazines. He's here to explain why. Good morning, Ed. Thanks, this is Adrian Matt. And 
and so this was this was a very different stance. It's it it's hard to find anybody who doesn't support youth sports, who doesn't um, want to do a heart emoji when you see saving a local hockey um, team or multiple teams, especially in an area where they didn't have the funding. This was hundreds of millions of dollars of business to Dix that we walked away from. And what would seem like a really difficult decision wasn't um, because on one hand, and we have a very diverse population. We have um, uh, politically diverse as well as um, economically diverse. And so we know that taking a stance like this was bound to um, we would lose partners and vendors, we would lose potential customers, um, we would lose potential teammates. Um, but we also fundamentally believed that assault style rifles didn't belong on the same in within the same four walls as kids soccer cleats. And so again, we put purpose over profit and, um, and didn't just take a stance ourselves in things like pulling this merchandise out of our stores um, and raising the, the age of sales from 18 to 21, but we also advocated for broader change. And in fact, we're one of the lead advocates just this year when finally um, we were able to get um, some traction and responsible gun reform and continued progress in this space. Julie, that's really what I find amazing. I've been in some of those uh, those discussions where profit and impact to the business is weighed against values. And that's really where it makes the difference. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear you share that. And there's a question in the chat. I'm glad to see people are, uh, t are writing in their comments. Please write your questions. We know that Julie would love to answer more of your questions than to just go through the, 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 the discussion. I know John Falk has a question here. It says, you know, in addition to all the compliments that you're hearing that we're seeing in the chat, Julie, how is the message about the foundation goals conveyed to the employees across the country? Yeah, um, loud and proud. Uh, we actually think that taking these types of stances, um, it's not the reason we do it, but it builds that stickiness in our culture it creates a pride in wanting to be a part of a company larger than themselves. And in fact, we do a number of events where, where as employees, we get a chance to be part of raising the funds as well as distributing the merchandise and meeting the teams and supporting the communities. So Frank that you saw in the video is one of our managers in marketing um, who got to fly out to Alaska and be part of that. And um, Catherine, to your point, while it was a local community, we're a national company, but we have operations in the vast majority of states and we engage our local team members in our stores and our distribution centers and from our corporate office to be part of that community whenever we give these grants. And so um, we communicate it regularly and often. Um, uh, it's part of, in our stores, it's part of the roundup. If any of you have been at a register and we ask you, would you like to round up to, to um, support mm -hmm. Sports Matter? Thank you. Um, $9 million this year so far in, in athlete contributions so that we can support many of these, um, many of this funding. So all hands on deck for this work. You know, really, Julie, that's great to hear how well you're doing that, how well you're communicating. What was the response? Another question from Leanne in the chat. What was the response that came through when you delivered that message across the country? Yeah, so it was mixed um, and we knew it would likely be. Um, what our teammates, though, regardless of what side of the stance they were on, I think they respected that as a company, we're a proud supporter of the Second Amendment. My husband was a sniper um, on the police department for 17 years. We know our way around guns. Both can be true. You can take a difficult stance like the one we took, but also support um, a, a, a right to bear arms in a responsible way. And so um, whether it's our stance on responsible gun reform or more, most recently our stance on women's reproductive rights, I think our, our teammates respect that we have a thoughtful position that we know that not everyone feels the same way, um, uh, but that we want to create a safer place for everyone. And we did have some teammates opt out 
And I think that's okay. As you're thinking about your culture and, and the stances that you do or don't take as a company, don't be naive enough to think everybody's always going to agree. Um, create the space for healthy dialogue and discussion and be okay if people choose to not stay because their values and beliefs aren't consistent with the companies because you don't need that dissonance and it's not right or wrong. Um, but it's reality. And I think um, um, we were we were pragmatic about it, um, but also felt that we needed to stay core to who we were. Nicely done. And well, you're doing a great job in what you're doing. You've already got people signing up in chat wanting to know if they can join Dix. I so, love it. <laughs> so it's wonderful impact on your talent brand. Just really quick, one last question. We'll turn it back to Catherine. But Brett's asking a good question. Brett Larson saying, well, you know, that was a decision that you made at that time. Do you have any updated data? Have you followed up and monitored the impact of the business? And can you share that? Yeah, I think that we have anecdotal data as well as very quantitative data. Um, when you make a decision, and we made the decision very quickly, but we didn't know what was going to fill the space because we we didn't want to take the time to figure out the now what. We just knew the what and the so what. Um, thankfully, by removing uh, what we call Lodge and Hunt in more than um, in the vast majority of our stores, it created space for things like for growing categories. And so it created space heading into the pandemic for 300 pound weight sets and treadmills and tents and fire pits and all the things that we all needed and wanted um, when we couldn't do anything but but be outside and stay in our home. And so actually our, our business has has fundamentally transformed in a good way because of a difficult decision that we made, but we didn't make the decision so that we could that. categories. Right. Well said. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just have to say, so as a, a consumer, we got a rocking couple pairs of rollerblades from your store during the pandemic so, and, and, and safety pads, <laughs> lots of safety pads, right? Anyway, um, so moving on to the next example of Dick's purpose-driven culture, um, retail has always been an environment where the customer is always right. That rule was coined in the early 1900s by retail magnets, including Marshall Fields. Um, but fast forward more than 100 years later, amid the pandemic and all the stress um, that Americans and uh, you know, people across the globe have experienced, um, a recent survey found nearly a third of Americans say their stress levels are so high that they sometimes struggle with even basic decisions like what to wear or what to eat. All of this stress has created a climate in which a select few have become far less civil and in some cases indecent and hostile. Dix took action, though, to prevent the few from having an outsized impact on its culture and work. Julie, can you tell us about Dix's sporting goods response? Sure. So as our CEO and I started to visit stores shortly after we reopened during the pandemic, what we and we were on a listening tour. We were having dialogue circles and seeking to understand. Um, to your point, retail's tough. But in the last two years, retail can feel unsafe. And we have extremes where there's guns brandished or knives pulled, and we always had processes for those, but we didn't have a good process for when a customer came in and was just a jerk. And frankly, our process was the customer's king and a manager would intervene. And the first thing the manager would do would be to apologize to the jerk <laughs> and remove the teammate from the situation. And what our employees, who we call teammates, told us was they didn't feel like we had their back. Um, they didn't feel like the customer should always be right. And oftentimes they felt like they were victims of racism or discrimination or just um, unnecessary anger. And they felt like we needed to be supporting them. And they were right. And so we launched this zero tolerance stance where we essentially said, we don't accept this behavior of any kind from either our teammates or our guests or athletes. And, um, and we think everybody deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And so now when a customer comes in and there's some type of altercation, what the leader does first is steps forward and says, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, ma'am, but we have a zero tolerance stance on this. And we believe everybody deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. 
And you're not doing that with my colleague, Catherine here. So we got two choices. One is you treat her with the respect that she deserves and we're happy to help you find whatever you need. The other is we're happy to help you exit our store. And we don't want your business if you're not gonna treat our people well. And we've gone so far as to fire athletes um, and ask them not to come back to that store or any store. Um, and what seems like a small thing made a huge difference to our teammates, many of which are minors. So we have 16 or 17 year olds being harassed by adults because of the exposed nerve that is our country over the last few years. And it's not okay. And, and we won't tolerate it anymore. That is, a, I mean, it's just like, it's really impressive and a recognition that, you know, you have a variety of stakeholders and employees stake, you know, their stake in, in the organization and the culture is, is important and, and that you have their backs. It's got to feel really wonderful, but to the customer as well to know that I think um, is also a, you know, is a, is a wonderful branding opportunity. I'm always thinking about the silver lining, right? Um, but we have a question sort of related to that. I wanted to go to Jenny's question. Um, she mentioned that um, she'd seen Dick's financial performance stock price significantly increase since 2021. Uh, she was hoping you could briefly share the major contributing factors and changes that, that made that happen. Um, and she's, I assume purpose-driven culture is one of them. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Jenny, for the question. And um, we're our executive chairman is a real fan of uh, book club. So we're, we read a lot of books here. So many of you might um, uh, read a number of the Jim Collins books. And one of them is Great by Choice. And it talks about capitalizing on luck. So we were lucky during the pandemic. We were Hello. far luckier than many retailers were because we had what people needed. Yes, and we were well positioned to capitalize on that luck. And so we had the best two years in company, actually the best three years in company history between 2019 and 2021, in large part because of um, uh, unbelievable sales uh, growth and category growth and things like fitness and things like outdoor and things like boats and bikes and um, a number of the things that, that you would expect running. Um, but also we made very deliberate plays and, and we have phenomenal relationships with our national partners, whether that's Nike or Under Armour or Adidas, or more recently, um, Hoka or Brooks or On Running. And we continue to foster those relationships and work through this pandemic, these global supply constraint, constraints together so that once we got through on the other side, we were well positioned to continue to sustain that growth. And that's one of the analysts fears, right? For those that were the Cinderella's of the pandemic was that it, it was a moment in time, but it's not sustainable. And um, uh, we've proven this year, just in Q2, we made more money than in all of 2019. So we've proven this year that it is sustainable. Now, 300 pound weight sets aren't sustainable at that level, but we figured out how to pivot and lean into the categories based on customer needs. And um, we're pretty excited about the future. That is just wonderful, I think, proof um, that this approach, the stakeholder approach and you know, purpose-driven culture really um, makes a difference, it matters. Mm -hmm. um, our research at I4CP emphasizes the importance of financial health as one of six key elements employers need to focus on to foster holistic well-being in its workforce. Research has well-documented the impact of financial stress on employee productivity and their personal and professional goals. There's a real cost to the mental bandwidth um, that, and our ability to focus associated with the lack of financial stability. Um, this next example that we're, we're going to talk about um, amid the pandemic and rising inflation, Dick stepped forward with an innovative approach to helping reduce the stress among its workforce. Can you tell us about this program, Julie? Sure. So the research tells us that the average blue collar worker um, struggles to find $400 in a moment of crisis or concern. That's the threshold. If I have to come up with $400 to pay for a gas bill that I didn't expect or car maintenance or insert example here, a health bill, um, th they're constrained because so much of our nation is living from paycheck to paycheck. And I think uh, inflation and a number of things are making that even harder because the dollar's not going as far. 
And we heard many stories of our teammates struggling with these financial needs. And for every teammate who shared their struggles with us, we knew there were so many more who weren't. And so um, complete props to Home Depot, if there's anybody from Home Depot on the line, because we benchmarked with them. They have something similar called um, the, the, the Homer Fund um, that inspired us to launch what we called our Teammate Relief Fund. And so this is a, a 501c3 charity that for every dollar a teammate gives, the company matches it at $2, so two for one match. Um, and in order for us to, to maintain that balance, we have to have some skin in the game as teammates. And it's been so amazing to see we've raised over a half a million dollars in teammate contributions. And then the company has, has funded it with, um, with some seed money and additional millions. And it provides monetary support to our teammates who um, need it most based on these financial hardships and crises. And so everything from helping a teammate get his mother safely out of Ukraine to helping another teammate manage bills in a prolonged cancer um, treatment to helping a teammate get their window fixed in their car because it wasn't safe for them to be on second shift driving through um, the inner city without a window and, and all things in between. And we're finding that everything from natural disasters to fires and even food and, and shelter um, uh, insecurities are popping up very regularly. And we're proud to say that um, we've, we've given, we're early days, we're not even a year in, we've given over $400,000 in grants. Our average grants about um, just shy of $1,400. They can apply up to 2000 and we have an exception for even more. Um, and so uh, we think that this is, um, uh, again, uh, what seems like a small thing, but such a big thing to help our teammates when, um, when they when they need a little support and a couple dollars to get by. You know, Julie, it, it again another demonstration of walking your talk of in making your values come to life. But one of the threads I'm hearing through each of the examples you shared today, and, and specifically the statistics, the data that you know from listening to your employees and even the collaboration between your employees or your shareholders or your suppliers, you have real insight into what really is critical. When you say at $400, that's the break. Or when you have very specific examples of the issues and the concerns, you're clearly doing a great job of listening to your stakeholders, your teammates, your athletes, et cetera. Um, I'd like to remind everybody again, please type into the chat your questions. We do have a question from Christina, and she's asking, what was the selection strategy to support the strong culture? She's guessing that hiring really helps to drive the culture. Is that part of your talent acquisition process? Yeah, it sure is. Um, and we've, we've honed it and gotten even better over the last uh, few years where We've defined our leadership competencies. We knew our culture. We've defined our leadership competencies. We've gotten even more clear about the need to put the athlete or our customer at the center of all of our interactions. So um, in our stores, for example, making sure we're screening for people who like to be around people, who want to interact and greet, and um, at the leadership uh, level, people whose, um, whose behaviors are consistent with the behaviors that we know work here. And uh, Satya Nadella used a term um, when he uh, first took over as CEO and, and he said, I don't want a culture that suffers brilliant jerks. Um, and we're not a culture that suffers brilliant jerks. In fact, we weed them out and get rid of them pretty darn quickly. And so how do we screen for those behaviors that won't be conducive to uh, to our environment. It sounds cliche, but good sportsmanship is essential um, because we're scrappy and we move fast and we have to believe in the sum of the parts um, as opposed to any one person's success. So we've gotten much better at that in our screening process. And then as we develop leaders, the other thing we've done is not, not unique to most companies. I think if we're being honest, we do a good job historically building business leaders we haven't done the work we needed to do to build good P 
people leaders. And it's not um, that they're not mutually exclusive. And so over the last few years, we've also doubled down in our strategy and our approach to how are we developing good people leaders and instilling those values and those behaviors that we expect to see as our top talent rises throughout the organization. That's a great description, linking the leaders and the culture and the customer, putting those together. Nicely done. Thank you. Catherine, over to you. Well, I, staying on the theme of, you know, financial well-being and supporting the workforce, um, I for CP research, our latest survey found that only 32% of large organizations prioritize support for workers' financial health. We just talked about what, what stressors can, can do to employee performance. Um, it's actually more likely that organizations aren't doing anything in this space. Um, what has Dick's done to support the financial well-being, the financial literacy of its workforce? Sure. Um, so I know this slide is wordy, so I'll, I'll start um, by apologizing there, apologizing there, but I wanted to highlight four things really quickly as examples. So the first one is we shifted from a traditional 401k to um, uh, safe harbor 401k, which allowed us to expand down to 18 years of age. I mentioned that our demographic skews very young. Uh, it's very different for me coming from Ford, where the demographic was was much more late career. And so our our chairman, uh, executive chairman, believes in wealth accumulation and the importance of building financial fundamentals in our youth who will become uh, the next generation. And so allowing um, and expanding that eligibility, uh, creating the match, but also we've gone on a, a 401k tour, information education tour throughout our distribution centers, throughout our stores to really educate our teammates around the benefits of savings and the benefits of a 401k. Um, we've also done uh, further to that um, financial education, it's not just around that hourly or, or um, um, uh, you know, store and distribution center population. We found that even our vice presidents and above who have a different compensation structure were avoidably ignorant. Um, I was one of those in some of these areas around the details of our compensation um, uh, total comp, whether that was the difference between restricted stocks versus performance shares versus stock options and how taxes worked and blackout periods. And again, wanting to educate and give our teammates the fundamentals so they can make the best choices. Um, one that I'm really proud of is, is launching Daily Pay. And this is, uh, this is a, a partnership that we've got with a company. It's a voluntary program for all of our teammates including our part-time teammates, which is the vast majority of our, of our population, to instantly access their earnings. And so they've earned it, but they haven't gotten their paycheck yet. And so it's, it's an advanced payment without the significant penalties that, that those of us generationally ago may have had to incur if we needed money sooner. Um, the average transfer is $106. So teammates just, again, you just need that little bit to get by, to get right. to catch up. Um, and we're proud uh, to say that while we've, we've, again, launched this less than a year ago, more than $49 million has been distributed early. They earned it. We just got it in their hands more quickly, and it's making a difference for, uh, for our teammates. And then last but not least, many banks are willing to partner with you, especially if they're in your local community and or you're, you're working with them on um, other savings plans. And we've got PNC Bank here who, who has hosted a number of webinars for our teammates to join around managing student debt and budgeting and retirement. So there's a number of different things you can do that, um, that don't cost a lot of money to the business, but make a difference to your teammates. Those are excellent, Julie, and very, very well designed, very, very nicely crafted together to address each of the areas of that financial support and, and financial health. You know, again, these are ways that you've listened to your employees, you're listening to your stakeholders and responding, and you've offered several, several examples of where you've helped employees or teammates, excuse me, and athletes um, in your business that are very real example of Dick's mission to be the number one choice for athletes and for sports enthusiasts around the world. 
But athletics isn't the end all where Dix is motivated, is it? Can you share a little bit about how and why the company got involved with a local elementary school and why that made sense in your mission? Yeah, absolutely. And again, um, I worked for a leader uh, at Ford who used to talk about find the proxy. If you uh, if you're dealing with a challenging situation or you want to be inspired, find the company who's already figured it out or find the right. inspiration elsewhere. And so this is another example of um, we spent time with uh, LeBron James at his I Promise School in Cleveland, where the whole premise is to recognizing that that not all sports access is created equal. We all know education access is not created equal. And, um, and as we spent time understanding what the I Promise School mission and, and success was, our, uh, again, executive chair, Ed Stack, um, said, we can do this. And, um, and, and we should do this because those who can should. And so we did a really rigorous effort around Pittsburgh because we wanted to start in our own community where we um, uh, looked for the right community that had the greatest need, um, but also had some of the fundamentals like a strong board of directors, committed parents, um, a, a teacher's union that was supportive, that, that recognized the help they needed and the help that, that we could provide. And so we ended up partnering with McKee Sports School District um, and, uh, and, and even the boys and girls club left this community. I mean, they were a, um, neglected and forgotten community that needed our help. So mm -hmm. we've got a video to, to share, and then I'm happy to add a little bit more flavor. When kids walk into the school, in some way, somehow, we wanted to make them feel like they were getting a warm hug from the minute they walked in to the minute they were leaving. What we've put in place is a series of programming and supports that make sure that they have what they need at every point of the day to feel safe, secure, that their whole self, because we believe that when we can get them showing up that way, the learning comes naturally. Oftentimes, we were like, yeah, we're going to do this and it's like, oh, okay, we'll believe it when it happens. You know, we never had like an endless place to come up with an idea from. It would just be like, oh, that's not gonna happen or, you know, we can't do that. But I don't think anyone feels that way now. And these kids deserve it. They deserve to walk in and feel welcomed and feel like this truly is their safe space. The sense of community is really coming to the surface. I think we're gonna be able to really bring school into community and community into school. We don't have forever, so we have to make that impact now. And if we stand united, then we can really do something really good. I'm most excited to see the kids' faces. Um, just uh, all the changes in the building. You know, when they come in, they're gonna be just blown away by what they see. So I think we're all excited to get started. When I walked in the building, tears rolled down my face because it's beautiful. It feels new. It feels completely different than what we've ever done before. In any partnership work, you have to show up and do the work side by side in order to really get the momentum and build the momentum that a successful partnership needs. It's a community. It's not just a school. If you communicate with the parents and the teachers, communicate together, it makes it easier for the child. We have our Tiger's Den, which has resources for like clothing and, and food and things like that that might be on students' minds that if they don't have something at home or there's you no know, laundry, a shower facility, anything that might be possibly an issue at home or possibly a concern, we will be able to help them with here. One of our biggest things is developing the whole child. We can't worry about academics if this is not right. You have to fuel the brain, and if they're hungry, they're, that's never going to happen. I just have fallen in love with all these kids, and just to see all these resources here at the school, it's just a dream.
we're doing this in perpetuity. This is a forever commitment. We're making a real difference in a lot of kids and families' lives. That's amazing. I can tell. Julie, I was watching your face while you were watching that movie. You were smiling and so <laughs> proud of this. We produce so many damn videos that I cry. Doesn't matter how many times I watch them. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, the again, the the chance to be part of something bigger than yourselves and the we renamed t together with the community, with the kids, with the parents, with the staff. We renamed the school around United, and hopefully you you got that sense of of the importance of being connected. But the other thing we realized is, as good as a school and academics and resources can be, if you don't have the wraparound services like before and after school care, like good food and nutrition, like um, relationship specialists and mental health coordinators and social workers. And so we've invested millions of dollars into the school to hire the right resources, to create those wraparound services, to put in the showers and the washing machines and dryers and, and to take our clothes. Um, the good news is we got a lot of kids clothes um, that we can help them with if they need them. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're looking to partner with local grocers to help with food and, um, and, and it said this is just the beginning because our, our dream is that other companies um, take a model that we're putting together and that more of us can be investing in our communities in a meaningful way um, to, to help um, restore our education system and provide, frankly, provide all kids the chance that they deserve to get the education and access to sports that, um, that others are getting that they're not. You know, it's an amazing story that you're telling, and you're clearly having an impact on the people on the call because, again, more people on the call are wanting to sign up, wanting to join. But, you know, there's also a very good question from Aaron and, um, and reinforcement or comment from Elena on the chat. And it reminds me of your early story about Ed's, Ed's father, I think it was, that had a poor experience that started this. And had a bad experience, not necessarily because of disabilities, but clearly went out to make a change. And you heard in Ed's comment, this is a lifelong commitment. Mm -hmm. This is not something we're just doing for the buzz in the media or to just look good. This is a lifelong commitment of doing the right thing. The question, though, that's in the chat, there's, these are wonderful things that Dix is doing. Are you looking at doing anything with adults and children with disabilities? whether physical or intellectual disabilities? Yes, um, thank you for that question and, and absolutely. In fact, we're looking at, um, we're inspired by companies who've created adaptable lines. Our clothing today um, doesn't accommodate um, children and, and adults with disabilities in the way that it could or should. And so our vertical brands team are exploring opportunities and, and our merchandising team is exploring opportunities with our national partners. Um, again, a small but important thing around even our mannequins and making sure some of our mannequins in our stores um, uh, show that physical diversity and, um, and opportunity. And our, um, we're about to launch our, our most recent teammate resource group all around neuro and physical uh, diversity and opportunities. And, and we hope to leverage that team to help us understand how we can lean in and do even more. Nicely done, Julie. Very nice stories. Thank you so much for answering. I do want to say before we close, I want to give Kelsey and Zeta great kudos for handling all the multimedia and all of the support. Um, just rock stars. Thank you both for your help. Julie, it's always an honor to work with you and to talk with you. Thanks for coming and sharing and letting the rest of the I4CP members get to know you better. Absolutely, thank you for, for a chance to tell our story. And um, my advice to everyone is, is um, 
find what's authentic and unique to your company and figure out the little things that you can lean into because one, they're, they're important for your employees. They'll help create that stickiness. Two, it, it, it rarely hurts your business. And three, makes you feel pretty darn good. So uh, I look forward to hearing other stories about continued culture evolution. Thank you, Julie, so much for inspiring us all here. Um, and I also want to thank all of the participants on the call for your questions and your attention and your interest in, in then creating a purpose-driven culture. Uh, Julie, you've just given us so much to think about today. Um, and we can't thank you enough for, for coming, inspiring, and sharing. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Kevin. Have a good day. It's always